you really have to acknowledge your hurt. Acknowledging hurt is different than being angry. Like, he did me wrong, she did me wrong. People are gonna hurt us. People are gonna disappoint us. Any long-term relationship, you need to be able to deal with without blowing up the relationship. We exaggerate the negativity and minimize the blessings. You can't be thinking about the worst parts of your life over and over and over again without having stress, nervous system dysregulation. You find out if your expectations are reasonable by how ballistic you go when they've been violated. Hi and welcome to another episode of Khan Clinic powered by American Muslim Today. I'm your host, Dr. Amir Khan. Today's topic is forgiveness and practicing forgiveness for mental well-being. Forgiveness is a psychological sense, is the intention and voluntary process by which one who may have felt initially wronged, victimized, harmed or hurt, goes through a process of change, a change in the feelings and a change in the attitude towards the given offender, including learning to overcome the impact of the offense, flaws and mistakes, including negative emotions, such as resentment or a desire for vengeance. Dr. Fred Luskan, who's the director of Stanford Forgiveness Project at Stanford University, author of Forgive for Good, presents evidence that forgiveness can be learned. It's a teachable skill. He devised a nine point model for forgiveness and makes it a part an essential part of a human well-being to incorporate in one's life. In three separate studies, Dr. Luskin showed the importance of forgiveness, especially the one from the Catholic Protestant Northern Ireland's family members who were murdered. Less being less angry, forgiving and being more optimist can also help you to become later on more compassionate and more self-confident. His studies and work, the ninth step of forgiveness, shows how people can experience less stress, reduce physical manifestations of stress, and improve interpersonal relationship, especially those of your loved ones. Today, we have the distinct honor of having Dr. Fred Luskin in our studio. Thank you, Dr. Luskin, and welcome to the show. Hey, thank you very much. Dr. Luskin, we're gonna start with interpersonal relationships. And the question that comes up first is, how to practice forgiveness people who you have close relationships with what would be the first initial steps to take regarding this the answer to that is maybe a little more complex than just a one to five thing first thing is you really have to acknowledge your hurt. So maybe that is the first step. Maybe that's preliminary. Acknowledging hurt is different than being angry. People get pissed off. People get resentful. People get angry. But forgiveness probably doesn't begin until you can touch your vulnerability. Like, not just am I angry to protect myself, but I've been wounded, I've lost something, or something precious is, is no longer with me. So there's that need to get inside and not just be hard, but touch something soft. The, the forgiveness thing is, well, I'm being honest with it. Now I have to explore it a little bit and open to that feeling. And that, that's a hard step for people, you know, to go from kind of tight, angry, protective to just a little softer and a little more open to alternatives. Sure. Thank you for explaining that. And what would you say forgiveness improves relationships and reduces anger? How does that process actually play out in those deeply personal situations? Well, let me answer from a, a broader sense first. There's only a handful of empirically proven things that relate to ex long marriages. And one of the things that's been shown to be a predictor of a successful long-term marriage is forgiveness. 
So one of the things you want to be aware of is you want to take it away from just like he did me wrong or she did me wrong or this group did me wrong to this is a part of life. People are going to hurt us. People are going to disappoint us. People are going to say the wrong thing. People are going to do the wrong thing. Part of our resilience and part of our ability to handle life is to be able to deal successfully with some of the the wounds of it. And in any long-term relationship, you're going to have wounds and you're going to have hurts and you're going to have even some bad behavior. And you need to be able to deal with it without blowing up the relationship. So that that's that's the first piece that it's it's essential for any long-term good human relationship. The second, the shorter term answer to that is you want to know that when you're reacting to something or someone that hurts you, you're doing so in a way that's in your best interest. So if you just allow resentment or victimhood to be your guide, we often make bad decisions because of that. You know, like at work, we're mistreated and we overreact or we hold a grudge and it turns out like it doesn't do us good at work. So an outrage or a negative experience is a really good indicator that something's wrong, but not a great way to make decisions as to what to do about it in one's life. And that's that's the crucial place where you can see the value of forgiveness. Thank you for that answer. So my next question would be something along these lines. If I forgive, I think I'll become more vulnerable. I'll be more weak. I'll appear weak. And he or she is going to keep on hurting me. How do I resist that? How do I overcome? I mean, you're always vulnerable. You just may not realize it. You know, you could leave wherever you are and get hit by a bus. Or you don't know what illness is heading your way. Or you don't know that the people in your life may be going in directions that you don't like or may hurt you. So we underestimate our vulnerability. Mm -hmm. When something hurts us, and our vulnerability is shown to us in a way that we can no longer disguise. We overreact to that vulnerability. We underestimate it normally, and then we overreact to it when it happens. In terms of vulnerability, it's really important to keep an understanding that even if the worst thing that happened to you was solved or that person apologized, you're still vulnerable. So then the question is, what do you do with that vulnerability? And many of us armor up or become tough or I can't trust again. And that's a a response to vulnerability, which carries costs. You know, if you trust less or you're a little less open, you run the risk of weaker relationships. Now, let's, let's say, what do you do with someone who has hurt you? You have to make sure that they're the right person or thing to become vulnerable to again. So if you're living with somebody who gets drunk all the time, you might not want to give them a third chance. If you're living with someone who cheats on you all the time, you may not be wanting to give them a fourth chance. So you have to use like common sense and thinking, when you make decisions about reconciling, the forgiveness piece is freeing your own heart from bitterness. You talk about staying emotionally open without feeling like we're hurting, being hurt again. What's the role and how do you play this interbalance between the emotions and the forgiveness? You know, the answer is much simpler than you might think, but also much harder than you might think. The essential problem is we're not grateful enough. So in our lives, we exaggerate the negativity and minimize the blessings. 
So when you're hurt, you may oversee what bad somebody has done to you, but undersee the positive of your friend, the positive of your family, the kindness shown to you like in normal times. So you have a distorted view of your own life, or me too. So the cure is to spend a little more time giving thanks and praising the people who are good to you. If you had parents who loved you, acknowledging that more regularly and spending a little less time hyper-focused on the issues where people weren't as you hope. That keeps things in a better balance. That That's an unfortunate, simple answer, but not easy to do response to you. How does that work? What's the connection between the forgiveness and the emotional resilience that one would build? Emotional resilience basically means when life happens and it's painful or difficult or even wonderful, Emotional resilience means we have the flexibility and bandwidth to come back to center or to move appropriately to what's next. So if you've been hurt, emotional resilience means you don't necessarily take that hurt out on the person who next sees you. You don't have to yell at them. Emotional resilience means that if you're happy and you come upon somebody who's sad, you have the resilience and the bandwidth to also allow yourself to be sad to help someone even though you were happy. It's a, a flexibility to be appropriate. If you've built up grudges against things, those can limit your emotional flexibility. They, they have you locked into a certain perspective forgiveness like softens those walls so again you can respond more appropriately to what's in front of you rather than prejudicing things from your woundedness or what happened in the past so that's some of the interplay between resilience and forgiveness thank you for that clarification dr luskin let's talk about reconciliation let's talk a bit about boundaries you met you discuss that forgiveness doesn't always mean reconciliation it does mean creating boundaries how does forgiveness help in a relationship to create those those boundaries and how do we go about that process please explain you know there's a real challenge and a real subtlety with forgiveness and reconciliation. Forgiveness is an inside mind body coming to peace. Reconciliation is returning to a relationship. Sometimes forgiveness can facilitate returning to a relationship, but sometimes forgiveness makes it clear, I do not want to return to this relationship because I'm free of bitterness, I've made peace, but in that I recognize that this relationship is not good for me. So like the, the metaphor that I give or the, the way of describing it is like you could be in a marriage or I could be in a marriage and the partner can cheat and the partner can cheat and you could say you know i think this is one bad behavior too much so i'm done with the marriage however i don't wish you any harm i honor the years that we spend together you know go in peace and but we're done that can be forgiveness without reconciliation or you can have a marriage where somebody has an affair and then the other partner treats them like crap for six months, you know, welcomes them back, but gives them grief every day. That's reconciliation without forgiveness. The important thing is that when you forgive and you're not quite as clouded by bitterness, but also by the identity as a victim, 
you're more likely to make a good decision as where is reconciliation a good idea? That's the crucial thing. Is this the relationship where it's worthy to try again? Or is this a relationship where I have enough data that it's probably not good? Or do I have to put some pretty strict conditions on this before we come back together? If you're rageful about something or you really are feeling victimized, you're not going to think clearly. And so the boundaries you make will probably not be in your best interest and they may be exaggerated in ways that don't give you what you want. So that that would be my something about those interplays. Thank you for that clarification. In a relationship, you're you're talking about setting boundaries for sure. And you're also have highlighted how and when to know that we need to cut ties with someone versus trying to forgive someone in a relationship. Could you explain that distinction a little, please, for us? I think most of the time you want to forgive only because you want to free yourself. We don't forgive for someone else generally. We may sometimes, if they have a very deep and positive past with us, you know, somebody who's been wonderful for years and they make a real screw up. And then they come to you and said, I don't know what the hell I was doing or thinking. You know, my brain must have been hijacked by aliens, but I'm really sorry. Can you forgive me? And except for the fact that they were a long-term good companion, you wouldn't. But you forgive them because of that. Most of the time, we're forgiving to rescue ourselves from a bitter take on life. Like that's its freedom. And that bitter take on life, as you know, has physical costs. You can't be thinking about the worst parts of your life over and over and over again without having stress and nervous system dysregulation and endocrine dysregulation, you can't. So there becomes a mind-body link between the perseveration and the endless rumination on mistreatment and physical experience. And at some point, most people say, if they are honest, I'm tired of feeling this bad. I need to let this go. And that's the entree to forgiveness. It's not that the other person deserves it or, you know, I want to help them, even though sometimes you do. The biggest thing is I want to I want to protect me from this downward spiral or this stuckness. And, and that's the forgiveness key. Thank you for that explanation. Dr. Luskin, let's talk a little bit about forgiveness for their sake or my own sake. And how does forgiveness help for healing, especially healing from within? What would you describe the thought process one should take for that? We forgive because that's a natural part of being a human being. Mm -hmm. Our basic, you know, template or wiring includes both forgiveness and revenge and resentment, you know, and, and bitterness. It's all hardwired in for different things to stimulate. So if you're angry or you're full of self-pity, those are normal human experiences, but they're meant to be time limited. Like we are not optimally designed to stay angry. We burn out if we stay angry. We're not optimally designed for endless self-pity. We become depressed. So the natural order of things for health is arousal, you know, acknowledgement of it, looking around for what needs to be changed, and then releasing it so that we can be maximally effective in what's now, not what was in the past. 
that's the healthiest thing. So when you say you're doing it for yourself, you're also doing it so that we can fit in optimally to our world. Mm -hmm. So if, you know, I'll, I'll give you a personal example. What led me to the forgiveness project was being badly hurt by a close friend years ago. And I was bitter and miserable and took it out on every, you know, I just, I was a cranky pain in the butt, took it out on everybody, in particular my wife. And, and I took it out for a while. And after a, 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 not a short period of time, my wife came to me and said, hey, Fred, stop. Like, I'm sorry this happened to you, but I signed on for a better person. That's what she said, you know, and it hit me that, oh, okay. So my suffering was not just my suffering. It was impacting her. It was impacting our daughter. It was impacting my relationships. And she gave me like a slap to wake me up, you know, that Fred, it's not just you. So when we look at like, how do we want to be in the world? It's to be emotionally flexible, to have grieved our losses. So it is for us, but it's also for us then to function optimally in the environment that we're in and be available to the people who need us. That's why unforgiveness is so negative. It takes us away from empathy and sharing of certain things that other people experience. Brilliant answer. Works. Thanks you for explaining that. So we talk just about how forgiveness's role is in a relationship. You said it's all right to grieve. It's all right to be bitter and it's all right sometimes to experience those negative feelings. However, at some stage you have to let go. And that is because there is a physical impact of keeping those grudges, feelings, negative thoughts within you. There's the stress that it causes, the blood pressure. Explain a little bit about the physiological effects of keeping that bitterness, vengeance, heart inside you. I mean, you just expressed it pretty well. <laughs> but look at it from a little bit like higher view, little more detached view. Everything that happens to us that we react to with negativity or pain or some sense of unfairness is a normal human experience that has happened since human beings have been on the planet. Like, there's nothing new. You know, it's not like me or my group of people is going to suffer something unique. So what we're dealing with is normal human experience, albeit painful. And it's incumbent on us to look at that history and look at human beings and figure out what are the skillful ways to adapt to pain and normal human experience. And they're time tested and every religion includes something about forgiveness. So it's not like we have to like rediscover fire. It's there. Secondly, and this is another like if you take a little bit of a meta perspective, we're going to all die. And everything we think we're holding on to goes bye bye when we go. It's not like we can hold on. You know, what I, I, yes, we can hold on maybe as long as we live, but we have to let go of everything. So the question is when and how voluntarily. And so that puts it in a different perspective. You know, it's like, I mean, if I knew that I was never going to die, you know, then maybe hating my mother for 400 years makes sense. But if I know I only got a modest amount of time here, that makes me ask a different question. What do I want to do with my mind during that modest time here? And so the question is, like, do you want to consciously let it go or do you want life to just let go of you? So that's the question, not should I let it go? 
pretty brilliant. Thank you for that explanation. You know, it's not that you should let it, you should let it go. Otherwise life is going to let you go. Thank you. I have a follow up question and some of the questions that have come in, I want to go through them as well related to forgiveness. This one in particularly catches my eye because if there is an ongoing hurt, it implies to that. So that's number one. The recent conflict between uh, Palestine and Israel, there is pain, there is anger, there is resentment, anguish, war crimes, and a lot of negativity being generated from there among the Israelites or the Muslims. Now, the question is, if there's an ongoing conflict, how would one even begin to think about forgiveness and how does that pan out in the long term? Let me answer the first part of that and take it away from the horror of the Middle East sake. So let, let's say you're in a relationship with someone who regularly lies, okay? You know, that, that that's just their character. You have a decision to make whether you want to stay in the relationship. So when you talk about an ongoing interpersonal situation, the only ongoing situation that we have to stay in is with our children. So you can walk out on a spouse. You don't have to talk to your parents again. You can ditch your best friend. You can change a job. Almost all ongoing situations have some choice there. So people say all the time, well, you know, I have to go home to them or I have to relate to them. And that's less true. Like you may not want the consequences of ending a marriage or quitting a job, but you don't have to. So the most mature existential thing is that I'm choosing a situation because it's slightly better than other choices. And that choice includes this bad behavior. So if I don't walk out of my marriage because I don't want my kids to be disrupted, but I'm staying with somebody who mistreats me, one has to remind oneself that I'm choosing this over worse alternatives. And therefore, I'm accepting that this is part of the package. Okay. So that's one of the answers. You ask then about an ongoing conflict, a particular where people are being like killed and violated on both sides all over the place. And that is probably not an ideal place for forgiveness. Okay. It's like we did, we did some work with Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've done some work with Sierra Leone. And while individuals can forgive, and they probably should for their own salvation. So if you yourself have had a family member killed in that violence, to stay individually furious, long term, that's not going to help you in any way, nor is that going to bring back your loved one. Sure. But we as like forgiveness teachers have pretty much chosen to stay out of ongoing raging hostilities because there's no space yet for easy grieving because the violence is ongoing and it's chronic and there is it's very hard to find safety where forgiveness would be really useful is if somehow even in the Middle East violence, let's say they agree to a ceasefire or they agree to a peace plan and there's a structure in place for finally moving ahead, then forgiveness would be invaluable to help facilitate a peace that at least has a structure to emerge into. So that that's my that's my best understanding of something horrible like that. So are we saying here there is no role for forgiveness right now because it's an ongoing issue until some of the prerequisites are set in the grief is dusted, soaked in, absorbed, the process of healing and forgiveness starts later on. Well, let me let me really emphasize that 
in order to really forgive something, you have to have grieved that experience and loss. Like sure. that's the preliminary and grieving involves, you know, Kubler-Ross's stages, some degree of depression and anger and bargaining and sure. you know, acceptance and denial. And it's a mishmash in your head. Sure. But the grief allows us to move forward into a new world. Sure. Like, Grieving is the mind body's way of becoming equilibrium again after something terrible or painful or a lot. That has to happen. If you're in an area with endless violence or endless threat or endless displacement, just surviving is a challenge. Absolutely. And so it, it makes it very hard for that grief process. And there's so much community grief, you know, with so much horror that, again, this would be beyond my pay grade to uh, facilitate forgiveness. But that doesn't mean that endless demonizing and escalation of how terrible the other side is is going to be useful easy either. Thank you for that clarification. Dr. Luskin, let me move on to the next question. I feel awful about the recent atrocities and I want to ask for forgiveness on behalf of the people who caused harm. I know it might not change anything and it will not change anything. Should I go ahead and do that? So forgiveness in the context of a mass occurring and the guilt that one is carrying. Does forgiveness play a role in this situation? It's like, should I try to ask for some other group to forgive my group? I think that's the question, because sometimes you, you on behalf of other people say, I want to ask for forgiveness. It doesn't really you have know, a fixed meaning. It doesn't have a really good context. And it may be just that you're actually asking for forgiveness for yourself, for something that you're not being able to do or able to do. Does it hold any yeah, meaning? That's a really good question. And it's hard to imagine that I can ask for forgiveness for people or things that I had not, no direct contact or control with. But let's say I'm in an arena where either I was complicit in something that requires forgiveness or I want to ask for forgiveness for myself. Mm -hmm. There are really three things that should accompany that, mm -hmm. the ask. One is sincere remorse. So it's an inner thing. You actually have to feel bad and have suffered because of either what you or your group did. It's not cheap. This is, you know, I've anguished over this. I know this isn't right. That's the first, sincere remorse. Second is you want to offer a sincere apology, not a cheap apology. A sincere apology is... I know that these actions caused harm, and I apologize for that harm, and I'm not making excuses for it, I'm apologizing for the harm. And then here's maybe an amend that I would like to offer to lessen the chance of that harm happening again. So those are the three qualities with which a request for forgiveness should accompany. It's not trivial and it's not nothing we're practicing forgiveness and we're trying we're enlightening our audience so one of the questions that come about about this is i've made some big mistakes in my life i've committed some sins some of them big how do i start to ask for forgiveness what i just said but the the real motivator is a general honest feeling of remorse for how i behaved and that is separate from all the excuses and the rationalizations and the bullshit that I put out to keep myself from seeing the harm I did. That's one, an honest accounting. Two, a genuine apology. Not, well, you know, I was drunk and I made stupid decisions. You know, it was, I behaved badly. No mea culpa. And that bad behavior harm other people. And I take responsibility for that link. 
my bad behavior led to harm? And then three, what can I do about it? So have I reformed myself? Like it's one thing to say I behaved badly in 2020, but the question is, what have I done since then to make sure that I don't behave badly again? You know, I've had people come into my classes in the past who would tell me that their grown kids don't speak to them and they can't connect with their grandchildren and they're t very upset about it and and there's nothing i can do and i said well if you honestly feel that you were a bad parent and they're holding you to it then make amends by going to the local elementary school and reading to some kids who don't have a grandparent like you have to do things to earn the request, not just, hey, you know, can you let me off the hook? That's not what it is. So practicing f uh, forgiveness would be the actions you take afterwards. It's very interesting you mention recognizing the mistake as being a Muslim or a practicing Muslim, you would say, if I'm really remorseful, I ask for forgiveness, I have to recognize my mistake, but not it's not only that, I ask for an apology, but my follow-up action is important, meaning I won't do it again. I'm putting in barriers where I'm making sure that the subsequent time, I am not repeating my mistake again. And that's the main gist of what you're saying if one is well, or i'm making amends somehow okay. you know um if i wrecked your car i'm gonna buy you a new car <laughs> if i lied to you i'm gonna try to straighten it out it's it's remorse in action excellent so practicing forgiveness would also include the actions and the subsequent how do you incorporate it in your life so it doesn't occur again thank you for that clarification dr Lasker. Well, very... and then you've earned your own self-forgiveness once you've done all that, you don't have to beat yourself up anymore. You did your best to make it right. That was actually my next question. If someone from a religious perspective does his own introspection, ask for forgiveness, do I need to ask for forgiveness for all little sins and mistakes I've made? Is that a silly practice to do? And does that help in practicing forgiveness? I don't think we're all required to have a list of everything we've done wrong in life because we all make mistakes and we all do things that hurt people what you want is an honest accounting if somebody confronts you mm -hmm. and a strong desire to be a better person okay. if you're constantly recapitulating your mistakes, you're probably not going to be that nice a person because you're too much in self-attack. So that's not helpful. What's helpful is remorse and change. And so better to acknowledge errors. Like here's the, the easiest example. Let's say you cheated in a marriage. You were a bad marriage partner and you now meet somebody new they know about your past and you say yeah you know it's true i was a crappy partner and you know as you know i've gone to therapy for the past three years and as you know i looked at myself and i saw boyfriend you can do some really crappy things so i'm working on not doing them again and as you've also seen like i'm trying to acknowledge that this is a different relationship so you talk about the ways in the present you've learned from your errors that's much more important than carrying around a list of your mistakes you know that that's trivial stuff what's really important is growing totally agree Thank you for that clarification. Dr. Luskin, another question on practicing forgiveness. Is needing your own space or at times cutting ties with others important or a practice that you suggest for mental well-being and i.e. to get to your forgiveness part? Is that a norm to do? You know, there's a difference between needing space and having avoidant security issues. 
Okay. Avoidant people are frightened by intimacy and they manufacture distance all the time to keep themselves safe. It's a disordered form of attachment. If you find yourself mostly creating space and giving yourself out, you probably have more of a problem than the other person did. It's something you want to be careful with. It's one of the ways that people make relationship harder is whatever happened in their childhood, they've learned not to trust. So when people get too close, they start pushing away. That's different than needing space sometimes. So here's an example. So you're having an argument with your partner and you find yourself getting all agitated or overwhelmed. It's really healthy to say, I need a break. Let's revisit this in two hours. That's healthy distance. What's avoidant is to say, nobody can talk to you. Get away from me and maybe I'll call you later. That's your inabilities talking, not needing space. In terms of severing relationship, the avoidant severs relationship rather than dealing with themselves and having difficult conversations. The space person says, hey, we've been fighting now. Let's go to therapy together. I can't deal with this on my own. Those are very different things. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you for explaining that. A couple of uh, questions for follow up regarding this is uh, some coming from your book, uh, Forgive for Good. And that's about setting appropriate right expectations and focusing on acceptance as a core practice in uh, forgiveness. Would you explain a little bit, uh, Dr. Luskin, about how to go about setting those boundaries, making those expectations correct, and how would one practice that? Well, you find out if your expectations are reasonable by how ballistic you go when they've been violated. Okay. So if you get furious or crazy when somebody doesn't do what you want, your expectations are probably out of alignment. Sure. <laughs> If you get somewhat pissed or sad or hurt, you're probably much more in alignment with your expectations. It's very healthy to share expectations, not just react to them. So I know a couple who the woman told the man that if they started a sexual relationship, she was expecting and demanding monogamy. Okay. So if they started a sexual relationship, he could guarantee that she would be monogamous, but she wanted the same guarantee back. And she told the guy that if she gets any hint that he's not fulfilling that, they're done. That no, you know, no histrionics, just we're done. And she said to him, that's my deal. If you buy it, you're buying my deal. So that's setting expectations, but it's not hostile. It's here's what I do, here's my consequence. Excellent, okay. And a follow-up question to this is uh, regarding petty discussions that start to happen in a relationship. The, the question that comes up is I wanna move on, I forgave her, uh, but he or she keeps on bringing up old petty stuff. It seems like she still has emotional grudges and has not forgiven me how do i bring about that change how do i make him or her recognize we got to move on honey you can't tell anybody they have to move on but you can share your pain and concerns with them so you're it's perfectly good to say you know here we are in a stuck point and i'm willing to move ahead but it doesn't seem like you are and I'm not sure what to do about that. That might be an appropriate response. Dr. Luskin, a question about give and take in a relationship, resentment and forgiveness. How much do I give? As more I give, give up, the more he or she takes up. Define for us what is the role of this, me being flexible and giving up the, my feelings and resentments in a relationship where are the boundaries? How do I set them? Well, any relationship you're with, 
you're going to have to compromise. You're going to have to stuff some feelings and you're going to have to make things, make peace for the good of the relationship. Because when you enter into a relationship, you now have three people, one you, one them, and one the couple. So you're no longer one of two, you're one of three. And that changes the dynamics. It's not healthy to stuff what you're feeling all the time, but it's also not healthy to just share any resentment that comes or any negativity that comes to your mind. What the question you're looking for is, how do I be skillful with my experience? How do I behave in ways that help me get what I want? And that's neither one polarity or another. It's, is this a moment when I share my resentment because it's appropriate and it's necessary? Or is this a moment where I take a breath and don't share it because that's necessary? There's no one, there's no one answer. There's appropriateness to the environment and then sharing ourselves honestly at that time. That's what's healthy. Last question, Dr. Luskin, please ask him. He talks about emotional support and the loved ones that are around him. What advice would you give to those who don't have loved ones around who they can rely on and they still need emotional dependency? Yeah. You know, in this current world, loneliness is a mental and physical health risk factor. I mean, there's there's a couple answers to that. One is join groups. You know, these are the join affiliate groups. Show up to church or wherever and, and meet people. Go online and find aligned people. For people who have, you know, their social skills are limited. Go to therapy. Get yourself help in making a relationship. This is a serious thing. It's not trivial. Journaling one's own feelings can be an outlet for it, but it is so important to develop those skills that if you're in a situation where you don't have support, use that as a, a fire alarm and take classes in cultivating friendship, go online, learn about how to initiate conversations, take that issue as a more important issue than almost anything and work with it because that's how imperative it is. Dr. Laskin, thank you very much for your time, your valuable insight on today's topic.